No cameras or lenses today. Part two is all about the critical accessories that you need to get your work done. I have some deeper dives planned and the Talopa 50 liter bag that I use will be the first of those videos and the final part of my gear bag series headed into the rest of 2022. This channel is all about highly contextual reviews. If you shoot, work, travel in similar ways to me, this stuff might work well. And if you don't, it may or may not. Last important thing before we get rolling, this gear took me a long time to accumulate and a few things were gifted too. So if you're just starting out, don't run out and buy one of everything. New computers are fun like lenses, but they're all about getting work done having machines that help you work how you need to efficiently, and with any luck, grabbing one that's going to last several years. On the Apple side, the M1 chips are the real deal. This is the base M1 Air, and I'm still doing just about all of my photo editing, Lightroom and Photoshop on this machine. It's not blazing fast. It slows down a little bit in batch processing. It slows down a little bit if you have multiple Adobe apps open all at the same time. But for the most part, if 999 is your price point, this is doable. And for general computing, your browsing, your Slack, Discord, Descript, it keeps up with all of that fine. I got this as an affordable, hyper portable option for my freelance year and specifically for my road trip. If it's going to be your main machine for creative work, maybe go with 16 gigs of RAM and potentially go with a 13 inch pro as well. The base model air is not the computer I would get as a creative professional if it were my only machine though, which is why I briefly want to mention this guy, even though it's never in my bag, obviously. I got this Omen in 2018. It has an Intel i7, 32 gigs of RAM, and an RTX 2080. It handles all of my 4K video editing and anything that isn't suited for a quick export on the MacBook. I only mention this so that you know that the MacBook Air doesn't quite cut it for all of my video needs. And if you don't have a new MacBook Pro with ports, dongle life baby getting back to the actual bag i'm pretty deep into the peak design ecosystem not sure yet if i made the right call on their carbon fiber travel tripod that i'm using right now meaning if it lasts for years and years i'll have no regrets whatsoever but if something unfortunate happens to it by then i will be a little bit upset putting the cost aside this has been awesome if you like high quality gear that packs small this is epic if you don't want it as light you can get the aluminum version and save a ton, you know, relatively. In fact, as much as I carried it around in 2021, I'm not on pace to do as much of that in 2022 and wonder if I could have opted for aluminum. Either way, if you're interested in falling deep into the Peak Design ecosystem, this is one of my favorite pieces of gear. If you aren't interested in using the capture clips at the same time, you lose a little of those ecosystem benefits. You can also make the tripod ultralight with their conversion kit. That's nice to do if you're gonna use the tripod as a selfie stick, if you wanna use it as a tabletop tripod, or if you really want to shed weight and are okay using that restrained height when doing landscape photography. On the tripod front, I also have the 3K Gorillapod. It's one of my oldest camera accessories. Despite using it for the phone and GoPro pretty heavily early on, I've never fallen in love with it and don't use it so often now. I think if you're set on a Gorillapod, maybe consider the 5K. And then if you're already considering that price point, the Switch Pod might actually be better for you, or maybe the Polar Pro Apex or similar mini tripod. Back to peak design, the capture clips are a great way to holster your camera on your shoulder strap in a very secure way. You've probably seen them by now, but they fit on most bags and the tripod plate slides right into the clip. I keep one on both shoulders, or sometimes one on my main bag and one on my backpack. It's not too often that I do a wield, but one day in Colorado, I shot with the 14 and the 100. And even if you carry one camera in your hand most of the time, you really need a good way to free up both hands without sitting down. For instance, if you're on a hike and you have both bodies, it's nice to free your hands up to eat, use your phone or carry or set up the tripod. I honestly don't use a camera strap too, too often but I got one for an event last year when I knew I wasn't going to have my bag and still wanted to have the opportunity to use the anchors that come with the Peak Design system. And again, for the purpose of freeing up both of my hands at times. This is their slide light. And like I said, it comes with anchors when you purchase it. On those same anchors, you can connect their wrist cuff. This is actually my preferred way to shoot and how I shoot most often. Even when hiking, I like holding the camera in one hand most of the time. And this, well, if used properly, is supposed to save you from 
a drop. It wraps around magnetically to stay put on your wrist. And then when I need to free up that hand, I can go from cuff to clip and do so that way. So yeah, not sponsored by Peak Design, but might as well be. The problem as you get deeper into photography and start taking a lot more photos and clips is that you have to store your shit and you can't really do it on the base MacBook Air. Because this is only 256 gigs, I try to keep the local drive to only non-photo files and apps. And then having a really fast USB-C one terabyte drive is how I'm able to work on multiple projects at once. These SanDisk drives are also expensive, but Apple is going to charge you $400 to go from 256 gigs to a terabyte, and this full terabyte is half of that. It was a no-brainer for me to trade the convenience of more internal storage for a cheaper drive that I could also use for fast MacBook to PC file transfers. These USB-C sticks are 256 gigs, and I use them mainly for smaller projects. If I don't have work saved on any other drive, and I'm doing a lot of editing work while still on a trip that I don't want to lose progress on, I may work off one and dupe the project files to the other. Similarly, while traveling, and now just in general, with the dual card slots on the R6, I like bigger cards. I like shooting in dupe, and that way I don't have to clear and format them as often. This will be less important as I wind down the paid photo work to a minimum given my new job. But while freelancing in 2021, I was shooting both a lot and frequently. I started running into storage management issues that I didn't ever encounter prior to freelancing. During my road trip, I shot thousands of pictures and hundreds of clips. I would often still dump the files onto a working drive each day, but being able to leave those files on the cards for a bit longer is always a nice last line of defense. Obviously, you still want to be continually backing up using your traditional processes for longer term backup and storage. And that's where these slower five terabyte bad boys come in for me. Most of my my personal final edits and client work lives both in the cloud and on these bigger five terabyte drives. And I'm getting better about keeping all raw selects and then pruning the unflagged shots that I'll never ever need in order to free up space. To be very honest, for my personal workflow, I don't have the best system for backing things up to their appropriate locations and doing so in a timely manner. I'm much better now but I wasn't great at this starting out. So while I feel very safe these days shooting in dupe and holding media on cards until I've backed up current project files, one regret I have is not taking storage and organization more seriously when I was starting out. The early stuff that I do have is hard to find and it's all disjointed on some two terabyte drives that I have in my Windows tower. So even though storage isn't that exciting, take time to figure out what you want to do moving forward and spend appropriately in a way that enables you to keep things safely backed up. And also at some point I splurged and spent the 12 bucks on a card wallet or case as I started to accumulate more. And that's been really helpful for keeping everything in one set place. Audio is a bit of a weak point for me on this channel. I have this lav and this runs into my phone and I record that way. It's kind of finicky, it's old, it picks up a lot of the hand noise and I dread the day where this doesn't get set up properly and I have to re-record. I use the Rode VideoMic Go on the camera when shooting clips sometimes. It's not the best, but it's a lot better than the onboard camera mics. And today is actually the first day that I have it right here, just out of frame, very close to my mouth, and I'm using that as a test. So I'll mark whichever audio I ended up going with today. And finally, this Rode NT-USB Mini is the mic that I generally have clamped to my other desk. I plug it into my PC and use it for Discord or other video calls. I typically only pack this in my bag when I'm traveling somewhere that I'll be working from for an extended period of time. Depending on the mic test that I run today, I may actually pull this into the scene and use it on this channel as well. Extra batteries are a given, and the RP runs through this smaller battery fairly quickly. I'm actually trying to get a second first party battery for this camera, but they've been sold out for a while. The RP shares the same battery as the Rebel T7i, so I actually had two first party batteries for a while, which was nice. For the R6, I have a total of three, and I've never really come across a situation where I run through all of them. I like to label the batteries so that over time, I know which are in the healthiest condition, the ones that have had the least amount of cycles. For instance, one is what I'll always try to run through first, two is that battery that I pop in after I drain one, and three is the pristine battery that I'm not using all that much. I might pop that in for special occasions like a time lapse in cold weather because I assume it's in the best health after fewer charging cycles. And I just recently snagged the battery grip for the R6 with some gift cards that I got for Christmas. It's a bit too early to say much about that, 
but that's where batteries one and two are going to live for me when I'm using that grip. That's something that I'll definitely review separately in the future. Onto filters, I won't spend a ton of time here. I already have a video comparing the Moment 10 versus 20 Cinebloom filters. 20% is more of a specialty use case. The 10% is more subtle. They also have a five as well that I haven't compared. I really like Moment as a company. I've actually applied to work there several times and I'm excited that they're creating products like this. I also have a Mist and Variable ND from Polar Pro that were gifted to me when I made my 85 millimeter reviews recently. The Mist filter is actually on the 35 millimeter right now. I'm not gonna go deep into these because I'll do that in a separate video and I'll compare them to the Cinebloom filters. The VND is the Peter McKinnon Variable ND Mist Edition 2 and this is what I'll have living on my 85 when I'm out in the bright daylight. The Mist is subtle and the build quality is lovely. I also have a 10 stop ND from Gobi, now Earth, that I keep in my bag for long exposure shots. I don't use this super often and should make a point to go out and shoot some long exposures intentionally, but I like to keep it in the bag regardless. Related to filters are step-up rings so that you can use a larger filter on a smaller lens. I got some cheap ones early on. They work in a Inch, but I would recommend getting higher quality ones that don't stick as much and that will last longer. Polar Pros are fabulous. They gifted me the 77 to 82. So that's what I use for my 82 millimeter filters on my F4 zooms. No sticking whatsoever, great edges. That's your premium option. I got this Lucid 52 to 77 a while back for my 35, the main lens I film these videos with. And that's pretty solid too for $15. After selling my 100 millimeter macro and replacing it with the 85 1.4, I'm officially out of EF glass. I don't plan on buying new EF glass at the moment, but I'm keeping the adapter around. I'm sure I may want to rent or test some of the EF glass where Canon hasn't filled in the lineup, particularly some of the Canon or Sigma wide and fast primes, for example. I'm tossing the GoPro Hero 9 and accessories into this video as well, because this lives in my bag for a lot of trips. I've liked having it mounted on the camera to capture a few seconds pre and post shutter for these videos. I've used the Hero 7, 8, and 9 fairly extensively. I wear a GoPro occasionally for hockey on my other channel and used to consistently hit about 100 gigs a week using them like that. As I consolidate most of my YouTube effort to this channel, you might catch a video or two about GoPros in the future. In good light, they're a good B cam. For most people, I'd recommend investing in your phone as opposed to a dedicated action camera. They seem to be getting a bit pricier and a bit more finicky with some of the firmware issues shipping when they launch. If you also actually use them for true sports like I do, then I think they're still a good bet. The DJI Action 2 or Insta360 Go 2 look like much smaller packages to do what I'm doing with the GoPro here. You've never heard me talk about the Ronin SC on this channel, but surprise, I do own one. I rarely ever use it, so I've never reviewed it. I did want to include this though, to be very transparent about gear acquisition syndrome. I've detailed before that I should have stuck with the EF518 over the EF514. This is the one other piece of gear that I feel like I messed up on in my own journey. I'm very much a photo first shooter and I got this proactively on a sale as I was heading into my freelance year thinking that I might need it if I did increased video work. It works fine, especially with the RP. It's just not something that I reach for all that often. If you're looking for a very lightly used gimbal, let me know and I might list this for sale. Unknown brand of lens pen, but great to keep in the bag. This click out brush can be used softly or more stiffly. And the felt microfiber scrubber is great for grabbing something off of your front element or particularly for grabbing something off of your EVF and cleaning that up because that's particularly hard to reach. Same thing with the blower, not exactly sure where this is from, but it probably came in one of those packages that you get with particular lenses or camera bodies. It's really good for blowing dust off of products as well. Removing the dust from your products in real life is much less time consuming than going through in Lightroom and cleaning them up with the clone stamp, for instance. If you take a shortcut, you don't dust off your products and then want to remove the dust later, you will be very, very sorry that you tried to skip that step. I don't use the trigger a ton. I mainly use the built-in intervalometer on the R6, but it's helpful for any type of stop motion stuff you might be doing where you're manipulating an object on a table, a surface, and just want to quickly access the shutter while keeping the camera stationary a few feet away. A wireless trigger might be a better investment if you shoot like this often. And finally, we've got the f-stop bag. 
itself. I got this last spring as I prepared for my road trip. I wanted something big enough to carry all my valuables on my person throughout the trip. While it's not perfect, I'm very happy with this almost one full year later. 